youth tear upon the car of blasphemy follow your prophet and on evil make a victory let our righteousness be a role model to our children making new generations of believers decently upbringing with parents as an example as gems we shape them fearing only Devoting our lives for Him. Bismillah, assalamu alaikum, peace. Welcome to Closing the Gap. I'm your host, Omar Dunlap. We have with us Sheikh Yusuf Estes. Welcome. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam rahmatullah. Sheikh, it appears that there's a gap these days between uh, the Sunnah wanting to follow the example of the Prophet Muhammad, mm -hmm. and modernism. So what do, what do we have for our viewers on that today? Whoa, you picked a big topic <laughs> here. As soon as you say Islam and modernism, mm. you, you, it's more than just a gap. Your world's apart here. Right. And that's a very interesting topic. Yeah, I think that uh, you probably make a whole series out of <laughs> this one, but we'll try to do it encapsulated in one program. First of all, let us look to what is this idea of what is sunnah. Okay. Sunnah is a word in Arabic that implies the way of something, the way something happens. For instance, the earth turning around the sun, that's the sunnah of the earth. Mm. Huh? The, the way that something goes, its normal patterns, the way that it is, that's its sunnah. And this was related especially to Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, his sunnah, his way. What was the sunnah of Muhammad on this issue? What was the way of Muhammad when it came to this topic? So this is how the scholars have defined sunnah for us when it comes to that. We don't want to confuse this with the word hadith. Hadith are the actual narrations or stories themselves about the sunnah. Right. Okay. So the sunnah of Islam to follow Muhammad, peace be upon him, is viewed, for the most part, to be his character. This is the most important part of it. Some people will interpret it to be literal to everything that he did physically without giving as much attention to what he did from a spiritual point of view or a practical point of view mm. in dealing with people. Let us take an example. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, never wore a motorcycle jacket. <laughs> hmm? Right. But they didn't have them. Right. He didn't wear zippers. Mm. They didn't have them. He didn't wear, uh, you know, the loafers like we have today. They didn't have that kind of thing. The clothing that he wore was very simple. A lot of people today say they're wearing the sunnah dress. Like, for instance, I'm wearing this thing called a robe or a thobe that mm. I have on. And it comes down low like this. It's a one piece, has uh, pockets in it. Pocket up here for glasses, things like that. I'm not trying to do a style <laughs> show, but telling you what I've got on. Mm. Now, is that sunnah? Oh, it's sunnah. No, it's not. Because he used to wear two garments. Mm. And they were very simple garments. What they wore at that time pretty much was what we see in Hajj today. Oh, yeah, they wore two garments. A lower garment that they wrapped around the bottom and an upper garment that they threw over the top. Mm. That's why you could see, many times it talks about seeing he, under his arm, right. but under his garment, because it is thrown over the top, so mm -hmm. to speak, and it isn't something like a shirt that we would wear today. So this gives us a contrast but in clothing, but in food as well. There were things that he ate that today you wouldn't care to eat. Mm -hmm. And there were things that he didn't eat that you might love to eat. Some people love to eat hot food. That was not something he liked. Mm. He was not into eating these real super spicy food. Right. Some Muslim countries, uh, I mean, they can't live without having that super spicy stuff. Mm. So we talk a little bit about food. You're making me hungry now, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take it easy on that. Uh, Transportation-wise, they use camels, donkeys, horses, uh, and ride anything big enough to ride, you know. Mm. Today, we don't even think about that. Some have never even ridden a horse in their life. Mm. I personally have had the opportunity to ride an elephant, a camel, a horse, a donkey, everything there is, and owned many of those animals back in my showbiz days, yes. But the average person, Muslim, I'm talking about Muslim, hasn't even been up close to touch an animal like that. Mm. So if you want to talk about modernism, from that point of view, we live in a different world. 
But when we come to his way of dealing with the people, that is the same. There isn't a difference really in how we should treat people today and how people were treated then. Mm. That, that should be the same. SubhanAllah. Now when we come to the concept of modernism, uh, what's up with that? What's Okay. Now modernism is, is referred to as being, you know, improved. Mm. We've improved our society. We've come up with some new stuff. The industrial age that we went through a hundred years ago, when, especially in the Western world, to come into this new fangled <laughs> way of moving around and doing things, transportation, fuel resources that we started mining and coming up with. Uh, the coal industry went way up. Petroleum in recent years going way up. And these things brought about many innovations, mm. innovations that we would have never imagined, especially in communication itself. Today we're talking and recording a program to be broadcast on television around the world. Mm. Yet a hundred years ago, it was a big deal to send a message down the street. Mm. It was something really a big deal to have a telephone when somebody would pick it up and say, hello, 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 yes, can you hear me, yes. <laughs> Talk louder. Hold on. What did you say? Because he's in the next room. <laughs> <laughs> so this we see today with email, text messaging, um, the way that people use computers, the Internet. This is amazing stuff. Mm. We're looking at things today that we would have only dreamed about. When I was a kid, if you'd have right. talked about things we see today, I'd have thought you were crazy. Right. That's even out of Buck Rogers. That's <laughs> way out there. You, know, you probably don't even know who's Buck Rogers. <laughs> yeah, you I know? was just thinking, who's Buck Rogers? <laughs> who's Buck Rogers? <laughs> well, uh, you heard of Superman? Oh, that's funny. Okay, well, he's, this Buck Rogers was a space traveler back uh, in the 30s and 40s. Oh, yeah. And they talked about going to the moon right. at a time when people didn't think you could go to the moon. Right. Today, right. somebody said, oh, Oh, so-and-so has been to the moon. Oh, really? That's amazing. You've been on the moon. We'd like to talk to you about it. If you would have said that 50 years ago, <laughs> they'd have locked you up. <laughs> they called you a lunatic. Uh, yeah. A lunatic comes Lunar. From yeah. on the moon. Oh, so what we're seeing of modernism <laughs> is a tendency to believe that whatever we have today is better than what we had before. Mm. And that's not true. Mm. That is not acceptable to say that. We have a lot today that we didn't have then. Our... Uh, mode of transportation is much, much advanced over what we had. We can travel around the world completely in, what, 24 hours or something like that? Yeah, it wouldn't take long. Yeah, I got, in I a got day, from, day and a half, uh, you can go around the entire planet, yeah, true? I, I got from Tennessee to Egypt in about 12 hours, something, 13, 14, somewhere around there. And stopped off on the way. Yeah, stopped, yeah. stopped in So Germany. to go clear around the earth, day and a half. Yeah. Well, when I was a kid... There was a book that was very popular and it became a movie called Around the World in 80 Days. SubhanAllah. And they were talking about, could you imagine this guy used a balloon to travel <laughs> so far, he used a railway to travel, he used a boat, he used this and mm -hmm. that, animals, different things he used to travel. And it was a very famous story. Today, if you said 80 days, what's the big deal? But they had a bet in that story that he couldn't make it in 80 days around the world. <laughs> you remember this story? Yeah, I remember it. And because he went toward the east, he picked up a whole day. That's what saved him because mm. he thought he'd lost, mm. but he still had a day to go. It's been a long right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, another day to go because uh, of picking up a day when you travel that way. But what is this modernism really? Mm. When we find a day, let us look to our society and see is it better or not? Mm. Are we living better? We're living richer in many ways. Better homes, maybe. Uh, better transportation, communication, we've already talked about. Uh, avail uh, availability mm. of foods. Right. We would have never had bananas year-round, mm. lettuce year-round, apples year-round. In many countries today, even, you can't do that. But right. where we live, ah, what do you want to eat today? Right. Name it, we got it. Right. It doesn't matter what it is. You even have it delivered. Yeah, to right to the there. house. <laughs> Call somebody on the phone, they're going to bring it to right. you. This is modernism. Mm. But what about the society itself? Mm. What kind of condition are we really in when we find the rate of divorces is at the very highest that it's ever been in history? The rate of rape of women, the highest in history, mm. especially in these areas of so-called modernism. Mm. The rate of drug abuse, 
unbelievable. When I was a young boy, the drugs were almost unknown. Mm. They were there, but it wasn't public, you see. Right. Alcoholism, forget about it. Mm. Even when the president's wife, Betty Ford, had to be put into a place for mm. alcoholism, right. the mother of um, Jimmy Carter for alcoholism, his brother, an alcoholic, mm. these are the leaders are into alcohol. Right. Drugs, alcohol, sex. Mm. Some of the things that I can't even mention on this show are unbelievable proportion. Right. Children being born out of wedlock. Mm. One of the prophecies of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, right. is that we would see these very things becoming so common. Right. And yet, we treat it as though it's no big deal. Mm. Why? Well, we're modern. You have to d adjust to this. You have to deal with that. When you see these kinds of things going on and how many people are negatively affected by this, then we need to stop and think, is this modernism really a good thing? Right. Without having the balance of society holding itself together on some basic principles, it goes crazy. Mm. And this is what a lot of so-called modernists have done, is go back to the other program we talked about, the, this free spirit business. Mm. Modernism and free spirit taking us away from the practicality of having a balanced society and having some rules, some norms that we hold to and say this is moral and this is immoral. And modernism is replacing morality. Mm. That's a problem. Now, since we're talking about modernism and you mentioned a lot of the things we have today, email and internet and television and all of that stuff, um, it seems like a lot of people are using these things to facilitate bad behavior. Like we mentioned the divorce rate, uh, which probably comes back to infidelity, which could come back to the internet, you know, people, social networking and all this stuff. What do you got to say about that? Well, regardless of what led up to what, mm. many of the things that we find in our so-called modern world can be used like any tool can be used, mm. positive or negative. Right. You could have a crowbar, and it's a very good thing to have to use to, to pry wood out of something or move metal around that's real difficult to work with because that bar of steel really does some good things. But you start hitting people in the head with it, this is a weapon. Right. You can use a knife to do a lot of good things, but people can be hurt with knives. Mm. So it, just like with any tool, you have to know how to use and respect it and use it appropriately. And the Internet is no difference. Mm. Email is no difference. The telephone, the way we communicate, this television program we're doing right now. There are television shows that I don't want in my house. Right. Most of them, probably. <laughs> well, that may be true, too. <laughs> but for sure, there are television programs that I want my children to see. Right. And there's programs I want to see. Right. There are things that I take a benefit, not for entertainment, enjoyment. I hope our programs are entertaining to a point, but I want to get a benefit out of this. And the easy way for me to do it is to see and hear and understand what somebody's getting across to me. Right. Well, we're going to go to a quick break, and okay. we'll finish that thought up when we come Speaking back. Speaking of shows. Don't, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back, inshallah. You're watching Closing the Gap. Fearing only Allah Devoting our lives for Him. Those who love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, for those who want to enter the Jannah, the paradise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for the believers, and that's why we need to learn and we need to get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us so that we submit ourselves to the orders of Allah. This is knowledge that we need to learn. Why we're spending more time to look into the verses and to the meanings of the verses in depth so that we can get to learn from it what we need ourselves to be steadfast, to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to ponder over the meanings of the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Devoting our lives for Him. 
Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Closing the Gap. I'm your host, Omar Dunlap. We have with us Sheikh Yusuf Estes. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Before we went to the break, we were talking about uh, closing that gap between the Sunnah, which is the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, his way, and modernism. And we were doing a compare and contrast between the two of those. So I want to take the show now in the direction of heading towards what does Islam have to say about these things. And maybe you could also explain uh, the current situation between the Sunnah and modernism. Well, some Muslims have the opinion that you cannot be really following Islam in today's world and at the same time take advantage of the many modern things that we have. Right. Others have the opinion that Islam is backwards and holding us back from progress. Mm. And others have the opinion that you can be a good Muslim and do anything you want to do. Just Muslim is being a Muslim in your heart. So there's a lot of opinions out there. Some of them have some valid points and others are way off the wall. So where do we find the middle road? Where do we find the place to fill this gap? How can we be the Umat and Wasatan? Mm. How can we be the middle way? Well, first and foremost is always to know about the topic. Study real Islam and find out what Islam is saying. What is the real Sunnah? And then look closely at what you're calling modernism and find what that is all about. Then carefully, you know, start to line the two up but always bring in mashura, consultation from those who are knowledgeable from those areas. Of course, we're going to have to turn to Muslim scholars, scholars who understand today's world and the sunnah. We need to talk to them and we need to ask them, how do we do this and how do we do that? Is this okay? Is that okay? And we receive most of our questions about these topics. Mm. Can I do this? Does Islam allow that? Can a girl be educated? Can I choose my own wife? Is it all right if I dress like this? Is it haram if I do so and so? How about if I'm on, at work and a lady wants to shake my hand? Mm. What do I do if? How do I handle this and that? These are the main questions we get again and again and again. People trying to find the way to resolve the issue between what is the sunnah and what is the so-called modernism. Mm. One of the mistakes that we will talk about right away is the idea of believing that clothes are the final word on it. In Islam, it's mandatory for a man to cover his aura, which is between his navel and his knees. For the woman, her aura around the house is not different, but when any man can see her, then she has to also cover her aura becomes her whole body. Mm. Anything which could be attracted you know, from some man looking at her and saying, hey, baby, okay, <laughs> that's time to get covered up. Right. And, and this so is her, people outside of her family, like immediate family. Yes, right. anybody outside of the immediate family, which is mentioned in the Quran, who, who is right. okay to see her, you know, uh, like, for instance, I can watch my daughter, she wants to nurse her baby, it's not haram. If right. I say, oh, oh, you're nursing a baby, okay, I'll come back later. Right. But it wouldn't be right for somebody outside the family to say, oh, my God. I saw this lady nurse her baby. Right. You know what I mean? So where do we find this middle road is by studying to find out what Islam really says about these things. It's not about the clothing, though. There is something that has to be covered. But just because you wear this doesn't mean that you have fulfilled all of the things of the sunnah. And just because a person wears a suit like you have on doesn't mean you're not fulfilling the sunnah. Mm. You follow that? Through this whole uh, series that we're doing these episodes, that's one of the things our directors ask you and I to do, to, mm. to maintain how we are. And so this is why we, I continue to dress this way, you continue to dress that way. But in reality, you may like to wear this way, I may, you know, it doesn't mm. matter. But what we're trying to get across is to find a way to close these gaps. Mm. And... One of the things, too, is when people go really extreme about what is halal and haram. Mm. And they give an impression to a new Muslim. For instance, you were telling me before we came on the set something really funny. Because <laughs> they tell us so many things that we didn't know, you know. Right. Well, if you have the Quran in Arabic, for instance. Okay, the Quran in Arabic is the Mus'haf. But if it has English translation with it, you and I know that that's been considered not the same anymore because it has explanation like tafsir and so on. Right. 
And if you gave it to somebody that's not Muslim, they want to become a Muslim, but they'd like to read it first. Mm -hmm. Well, this really happened. Mm -hmm. It really happened that a man came to me who had studied Christianity, became a big time Christian, but then he wanted to study Islam. He wanted a Quran and they told him, you can't have one because you're filthy. SubhanAllah. You can't have it. He said, well, how will I know what it is? They said, you get a translation. He said, I want to know what it says in the Arabic language. Mm. They said, do you know Arabic? He said, well, I'm trying to learn it. They said, after you learn the Arabic, then we can uh, talk about it, but you have to be a Muslim first. Mm. He went to an Arab country with Arab Christians, mm. and they taught him the Arabic language, and they gave him pieces of Quran here and there and told him, look out for this, be aware of that, and they tried to just bring parts of stories. Right. By the time I met him, he was pretty much against Islam. SubhanAllah. But I went to his house that night and sat with him, and we went over a lot of different languages together. Mm. By the morning, he decided Islam was a lot more in his favor than he had thought. Mm. He made shahada that day. Alhamdulillah. But he said, you know, it's, it's sad that they told me I couldn't even have a Quran. Right. Tell us your story. What happened to you? Okay. You had a Quran. A lady came to you. Yeah. We won't mention who she was, but she knows who she is. Uh, I was same thing. I, I had the understanding that you, if it has Arabic, you can't give it to a non-Muslim, and uh, and so the lady asked to read it. She was interested in Islam, and uh, she said, uh, "Okay, can I see your Quran?" And I said, "Did you have any pork today?" That was the first thing because I, you know, she's touching the pork and eating the Quran. I don't want to give it, you know, or reading the Quran. Reading the Quran. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to give it to her, you know. You ate her if she. You you told her if you ate pork today. <laughs> Yeah, you, you can't read the Quran. Can't read the Quran. Where did this come right. from? It was just what I had in my mind that uh, you know a non-Muslim <laughs> can't touch it. So that's what I thought. You know, this was early on. You know, <laughs> I was first becoming Muslim. So it's fun Allah. It's amazing the things that we you know put up like that. Yeah, it, it's important to know what the real Sunnah is. Mm. Sometimes a brother will tell you, "No, this is not in Islam," and you come back and you look. Well, I'll give you another example for that. Hair. Mm. Brother's telling you it's okay to shave your beard. But you must cut this hair. Mm. This, you must cut. This has to be short. Mm. But what about the beard? Well, if you grow it, okay. If you don't, there's nothing in Islam say so you have to grow it. Uh -huh. Well, we investigate Islam. Well, you we look at the Sunnah we find from Sahih Bukhari. And you look in uh, volume uh, 6, uh, hadith number 7, uh, uh, 798, I think it is. Mm. The, it doesn't really matter the number. But it tells us in there, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was asked about the beard, the lahya. And he said... This is a commandment now. He's saying, you leave it alone. You leave it. Right. This is what he said. He didn't say, cut it short, cut it like this, only cut it. No, he said, leave it. Except mm. for this, over the lip, this you cut. Mm. But everything else, you leave it. And that's a commandment. Right. Now, without any analogy, you're saying, yeah, but in modernism. Mm. No, that's what he said. So here we have uh, some brothers who came to me one time telling me, Hey, this new Muslim, he just made shahada, has long hair. Mm. Tell him he has to shave it. I said, what mm. do you mean? They said, no, it can't be longer than this. I said, why? Well, we're in the military, we know that. No, your military told you that. Yeah. But in my case, look, this hair right there, many Muslims would think this hair is too long. But how long was the hair of the Prophet? Most of them don't know. They don't it's know that. About that length. They yeah. could see his hair just like this. This mm. is the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa It's mentioned in hadith that uh, they could see his hair coming to his shoulders mm. and they could see his beard from standing behind him. SubhanAllah. <laughs> MashaAllah. So you see this, the difference of sunnah versus so-called modernism. Right. And it seems that there's a lot of confusion because like you said, they said that you have to cut your hair short because you're in the, because they were in the military and they're actually mixing the modern ideas in with Sunnah and saying it's Sunnah. SubhanAllah. That's yeah, there are a lot of things that we could uh, spend programs on the same subject. Mm -hmm. But what I would like to do is like conclude this by wrapping up and saying study more. Spend time with the scholars who have learned in different parts of the world. Don't just take somebody that only learned Islam in a backwoods village. He mm -hmm. only knows his own village. Right. And we don't like to take rulings, Islamic rulings, from somebody who's never even been in our country. Mm. It doesn't make sense that I'm going to call Saudi Arabia and ask them to give me a ruling about something over there they don't even understand. Right. Some countries, uh, a woman driving a car is uh, very bad. This right. is a bad omen for them. They don't like that. 
other countries. In my country, my wife does all the driving. In fact, if I want to drive, she gets out of the car. I'm not going to ride with you. That's the same with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's my insurance rates are a lot lower if I let her drive, too. <laughs> same with me. <laughs> this is another point. Now, what about insurance? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's halal haram stuff. Right. But insurance is gambling. Mm. Therefore, it's forbidden in Islam. Mm. So that means I can't drive a car. Okay, mm. now you got a new problem. Right. What am I going to do? Well, in the case where something is darora, darora means necessity. You don't have any option in it. Mm. Then Allah, he has a concession for you, ruksa. Right. right. And in this case, you can do what's mandatory, like a photograph that has to be on an ID, those right. kind of things. But going around with a whole wallet full of pictures, hey, you want to see what my wife looks like? You know, you don't do <laughs> yeah. that. Right. That's not Islam. Yeah. You have to know the difference between what is the real sunnah and what is the modernism. Get, mm -hmm. get it together. Right. Well, uh, unfortunately, Sheikh, uh, that's all the time we have for us today. We thank you for being with us. And uh, we would like to encourage our viewers, make sure you catch us next time, inshallah ta'ala. Until then, I'm your host, Omar Dunlap, wishing you peace. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, you Tear upon the car of blasphemy Follow your prophet And on evil make a victory Let our righteousness Be a role model to our children Making new generations of believers Decently upbringing With parents as an example As gems we shape them Fearing only Allah, devoting our lives for Him.